Hello, my name is Dr. Jim Sharps, and I'm so happy to be invited to your meeting to talk about one of my favorite topics, the germ theory and the role of germs in the disease process. I, I, I want to focus on primarily three things in this presentation. First of all, what is disease? We're going to talk about the allopathic versus the original, original medicine perspective on disease. We're going to talk about the germ theory itself and the role of germs in the disease process. And we're also going to cover evidence for the original medicine superiority in preventing and reversing all diseases. So before we get started, let's invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. Gracious Father, we praise you, we glorify your name as we thank you for your blessings. We pray that you be with us and camp and your angels around us, that we proceed in this, in this time that we spend together, this presentation and those that are within hearing range of this presentation, that we proceed in the way that's, that will be consistent with your purpose and will bring honor and glory to your good and holy, most precious name. We pray this prayer in the, in the very precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, your son, our very best friend, and the one and only master healer. So let's get on with it. So the first thing, the first thing we want to discover, what is disease? And there's the allopathic medicine approach to defining disease and the original medicine approach. And in the allopathic model, the definition is disease is an abnormal condition of an organism which interrupts the normal bodily functions that often leads to feeling of pain and weakness and usually is associated with signs and symptoms. So that's the allopathic model, signs and system focus. Uh, and then on the original medicine side, some also call it the natural healing side, the naturopathic side. You'll see why I talk about the original medicine approach. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. So a little bit different approach in, in the two paradigms, a signs and symptoms approach versus a violation of, of laws, of, of the laws of health paradigm. And one of the major shortcomings of the allopathic signs and symptoms approach and that health system is a lack of knowledge of the true role germs play in the disease process, namely what we are accustomed to, the germ theory. Even with currently with the coronavirus, this is also all a part of the same paradigm, this germ theory. So let's talk about that, but first let's be clear in what our definition of what original medicine is. Original medicine, first of all, draws its knowledge and power from the original author and creator of both the moral and natural laws. It's a powerful set of time-honored principles and techniques for developing the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. So in original medicine, we seek first the knowledge of the original knowledge giver for the most enabling and empowering road to health and vitality. So let's start with this germ theory and how it started. And here you see this name, Antoine Van Leeuwenhoek. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Now, he was, he was uh, around in the, in the 16th to 17th century, and he is attributed to being the father of microbiology. Now, Antoine Van Leeuwenhoek, he was, uh, a kind of a genius. He started in the 19, in the, in the 1670s, he started to explore microbial life with his microscope. And this was one of the notable achievements at that time of what was called the golden age of Dutch exploration and discovery. It was that time period between the 1590s and 1720s. Let's look a little bit closer at Antoine van Leeuwenhoek. He was a very bright person. He, uh, he had multiple uh, fields of endeavor he was involved with. He was a scientist, he was a businessman. He also was a draper. And in drapery, they had these, these um, threads, different types of threads. And he developed this crude microscope to be able to distinguish the quality between the quality of different kinds of threads. And in the 1670s, 
he started to explore microbial life with his microscope, which is kind of interesting. This is one of those notable achievements of that golden age of expo exploration that we talked about. And using his single-celled microscopes of his own design, which is the first ones of, uh, uh, known at that time, Van Leeuwenhoek uh, was the first to experiment with microbes, which he, he originally referred to as these little animals or animalcules. And I remember uh, one of the uh, studies I, I read, they were called these tiny, tiny animals or little beasties, because these, these were these ugly, funny looking, um, tiny animals that seem to hang around all kinds of dead, dying, and diseased material. So Van Leeuwenhoek basically uh, came up with this thing uh, of this germ theory by saying, look at all of those germs around this diseased organ. They are the ones that's causing the diseases. Now, let's skip ahead a couple of hundred years. Louis Pasteur, he was a French biologist. He's a microbiologist, a chemist. And he was renowned for his discoveries of the principles of vaccination, fermentation, pasteurization. Now, there are others at that time. There was uh, Edward Jenner and, and many others. But he's the one that is really attributed to a lot of what is this modern day um, father of microbiology. So let's focus in a little bit more on him. He, he was remembered primarily for his breakthroughs in the causes and prevention of diseases. His discoveries provided direct support for the germ theory disease as it is applied today in clin clinical medicine. And he is best known, as we well know, for, uh, to the general public for his invention for treating milk and wine to stop bacterial contamination. A very important um, uh, contribution to, to that particular um, uh, necessary requirement. Um, uh, and, and, and we all know Louis Pasteur very well as the, uh, the namesake for this term called pasteurization, the killing off of microbes, the bacteria, the fungus the, uh, that, that is in wine, milk, and other products as well. And he is popularly known as the father of microbiology. But wait a minute, didn't we just say that Antoine Van Leeuwenhoek was the father of microbiology? Let's look a little bit closer at Pasteur. He was really an average student and not particularly academic. He studied philosophy for his undergraduate degree and he got a bachelor's degree. He also um, was appointed professor of chemistry at the University of Strasbourg in 1848. In addition to his bachelor's degree, he did get a master's degree in chemistry. And he it was involved with beverage contamination. Um, and, and that's what led him to the idea that these microorganisms affecting animals and humans were the cause of disease. Uh, Pasteur also, unbeknownst to many, discreetly told many of his fam much of his family, all of his family, as a matter of fact, never to reveal any of his lab notebooks to anyone. Pasteur is also have been known to have, be, have given many, several misleading accounts and played, and played deceptions in his most important discoveries. He did not have any experience in medical practice. He did not have a line, uh, 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 he did not have a, a medical license at all. And he was criticized for keeping secrecy for his procedures and not giving proper preclinical pre trials uh, uh, with animals, uh, or, or any kind of uh, trials. So there was a lot of secrecy involved. Uh, and something else you should know about Pasteur, he was, he was a very dynamic individual. He was very outspoken. He was known to be very rude at times. He, he was tall, he was over six feet tall, and he had a very commanding uh, presence. So he, he was very dominant during that period of time, and he was very forceful in, in gaining acceptance for this germ theory. Now, around that time, you probably never heard of Pierre Jacques Antoine Béchamp. 
he was born in 1816 and, and he died in the early part of the 20th century. He also was a French scientist known best for his breakthroughs in applied organic chemistry and his bitter rivalry with Louis Pasteur. And his dispute with Pasteur led to efforts to have his work placed on what was called the Index Librorum Prohibitorum. This is the index of books prohibited by the Catholic Church. If we remember at a previous time, people like Cop Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo were also kind of ostracized and they were accused of heresy when at that time they talked about the earth being the center of the universe and the sun and everything rotating around the earth. Pasteur had that same kind of distinction at a later period of time, put it, being put on this index librorum prohibitorum. And, and I, I don't know if you know this, but in the Catholic Church, if you don't receive the nihil obstat or the imprimatur, you are forbidden to read those books. And that is the dubious distinction that Pierre Jacques Antoine Béchamp had. He died at the age of 91, and his work basically faded completely into uh, scientific obscurity, and Pasteur's version of the germ theory is dominant. He did discover, though, that molecular granulations and biological fluids were actually the elementary units of life. And Béchamp named his theory the microzyme theory. And he named those, those uh, microscopic um, uh, substances microsomas, or tiny enzymes. So let's focus in now on this germ theory versus the microzyme theory. Uh, uh, first, uh, let, let's talk a little bit more about Bashan. He was an accomplished student. He did receive a doctor of science degree and a doctor of medicine degree. And he ran a pharmacy in the city. So he was steep into that whole scientific method and practice. In 1854, he was also appointed professor of chemistry at the University of Strasbourg, Strasbourg a post previously held by Louis Pasteur as well. He discovered enzymes and cells evolved amid favorable conditions into multicellular organisms. He denied that bacteria could invade a healthy animal and cause disease, and Bayshaw claimed that an unfavorable host and environmental conditions destabilized the host's native microsomes. So let's now focus in a little bit closer on this germ theory as proposed by Louis Pasteur and compare it to the tenets and, 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 and those facets of the microzyma theory. And in summary, what the germ theory says is that germs cause disease. They produce toxins in healthy tissues. Germs should be destroyed because if you don't destroy them, they will cause further disease. Now let's focus in on this next item. Germs are destructible and Many of you might not be aware of the fact that any, for any drug that comes into the market, and this is where the FDA, FDA comes into play, and a lot of these, um, these services that are there so-called to protect us. But this phenomenon LD50, it stands for um, the lethal dose that kills 50% of the test population. And that's, and, and, and that's a long drawn out process it can take years, it can take up to seven year or more years to go through this LD50. Because in this LD50 process, what you're doing is, uh, let's say it's mice or pigs or rats or chimpanzees, whatever that test group is, what you have to do is go through some rigorous testing to show what the lethal dose is to kill 50% of that population. So uh, they start with a low dosage, and then you, and then you, and then you get into a dosage that kills 50% of the population. You go all the way up to 80, 90%. But something very interesting happens as soon as you get into that 93 to 97 percentile. All of a sudden, that drug or that substance is no longer effective. And something even more interesting happens that whatever that 
test environment is, it actually adapts and it actually flourishes as a result of being administered higher and higher amounts. So no matter how much you double, then you start developing these superbugs. That's why you, you're noticing that even in the farming business, they're talking about going naturally, not because they want to, because they're creating these superbugs and they know, they're realizing that once you feed the soil properly, those bugs can't invade the plant. It's no longer susceptible. So that LD50 phenomenon is, is very interesting to keep in mind as we continue to proceed. And be, but because of it, what they, they, the whole focus is, is this whole sign and symptom of these germs. They have to be destroyed, but, but this LD50 limits its effectiveness. And so what do they use with this model as a result? They use antibiotics, vaccinations, chemotherapy, radiation, drugs of all kinds to basically destroy that environment. Now let's focus in for a minute now on the microzyme theory or the micro, microzoma theory as proposed by Pierre Jacques Antoine Béchamp. In his thesis, germs result from disease is found in decomposing tissues and liquids. Germs serve a useful purpose. They break down waste for elimination. Germs adapt to the environment. They're either good or bad based on the environment. So if it's a good environment, they, they cohabitate with all the other germs and actually do some good things, like make vitamin B12 and other synergistic processes. However, if you have a whole lot of waste there, and you have a whole lot of decomposition, their job is to break it up. And, and, and the more waste you have, the more prolific they become because they, they, they can reproduce more and more and more. And actually it's the result of their toxins that's thrown uh, out while they're breaking down the other decomposing tissue that actually causes and exacerbates infections and, and disease. And in this model, however, you use probiotics, you use herbs, you use diet cures, you use lifestyle and environmental changes, and it's a completely drugless approach. So, uh, so let's take a look at a particular situation. Let's say that in this particular room that I'm in, there's a lot of mice or roaches or whatever running around. For the germ theory, since they need to be destroyed, it's what I call the hand grenade approach. You throw a hand grenade in there and try to kill them all. Now, with this LD50, even with that, you don't kill them all. They might, be, they might limp out or something like that. But look at what else happens. You also create a whole lot of collateral damage. The walls are broken down and all the, and all the other coexisting elements in this room are destroyed in the process. Whereas on the microzyma theory approach, you look at those same mice, those uh, cockroaches or whatever they are, insects, and you look and say, oh yeah, they're there because of all of that food there and all of those crumbs. So you clean it all out and guess what? That you don't kill them, they just serve their purpose. They, they don't um, uh, continue to pro proliferate they don't have any progeny and they just die off naturally after a while. And so they, then they have to go over to another hospitable host because you're no longer being hospitable. So that essentially is how the two different approaches work. The signs and symptoms approach says you got to get rid of them. The, the hand grenade approach, the, the, the microzyme theory approach says it's a cleansing and rebuilding. Let's look at where, what the weaknesses are. Let's look at those deficiencies, clean out all the waste and, and meet and fill in those deficiencies. And, and the host is resistant to any of those germs that require a host uh, in a particular condition in order to survive and proliferate. So let's look at um, this whole area of scientific studies. And what I want to go through is what it, uh, um, this analogy to show you what happens with some of these scientific studies, so-called, that basically demonstrate the efficacy of drugs or the germ theory, whatever you want to call it. And this study 
is three scientists and the centipede study. And in this study, in the centipede study, these three scientists, the first scientist picks up and hands the centipede over to the second scientist who places it on a hot tin. And the third scientist claps his hands and says, jump. And, 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 the, and the centipede jumps off. And then, the, and, and then what happens is as they continue this study, the first scientist starts cutting two legs off at a time from the centipede as they continue the process, handing it, it off again to the second scientist who places it in onto a hot tin and the third, third scientist claps his hands and says jump and the centipede struggles to jump off the hot tin until the last two legs are cut off. So all the way up, 50 legs cut off, 60, 70, 90, and two, le two legs left, and it still manages to hop off. So the centipede study continues, and no matter how many times they repeat the study, there is incontrovertible evidence that the centipede will not jump off that hot tin um, when all of the legs are cut off. It just won't. And the conclusion of the study is that when you cut off all the legs of the centipede, he goes deaf. Interesting, isn't it? So what is the point that I was trying to make with this study? There are a number of things that we need to understand about studies. And, and this is where it further contaminates and exacerbates this whole germ theory. First of all, they need to be destroyed. And then you have all these studies that demonstrate the efficacy of this drug or the, whatever the scenario they're trying to, to portray. But let's look at this a little bit closer. Scientific studies. Many studies demonstrate subjective bias. In, in this particular study, their whole abstract, the whole substance of it, was this preconceived notion that the more you cut off the legs of the centipede, the more it impacts their hearing. Now, they went on and on doing this and, 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 and kept jumping off and jumping off. But then finally, at the end, when they cut off the legs, they said, you see, we were right all along. And I don't know if you've done this. Um, I've looked at some of these studies. They're really interesting. Um, let's go further and look at some of the other interesting aspects of studies. First of all, studies are generally done on animals, not on humans. There are some similarities, but there are some differences also. And that's why you're seeing so many problems with uh, a lot of the LD50. And then after the, the, the uh, pre-market testing, as soon as it goes out to the general public, when people have all these different capacities, and requirements, you're getting some mixed results. And the studies, I, uh, um, I, I, I remember one time I was reading the, um, uh, uh, some of these studies, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the major um, book where they talk about all of these different drugs, which can really put you to sleep. They're, they're long and drawn out. Uh, the PDR, the physician's desk reference. And it shows that many of those drugs perform marginally better than placebo. I remember reading about one study, it showed that the, the drug was effective against 30%, the placebo was 47%, and, and there, was all, there was that certain percentage that basically um, uh, did well regardless. So, and, and a lot of the, the, you know, the control group, um, still had um, a, 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 a certain percentage effect. But the interesting thing about that study, as I remember it, I said, wait a minute. A lot of times, it's, if your mind is right, if your spirit is right, and again, remember we said the original medicine approach focuses on body, mind, and spirit, not just the body. With that, that mind, you know, many studies are showing that two thirds of your health is your mind and your spirit. And only one third, the percentages differ all over the place, is really physical. So it's kind of really interesting when you stop and you understand that 
when you look at some of these studies and you look at some of them, uh, they use these statistics. And I'll just say statistics don't lie, but lies use statistics. And they use these numbers to give the best uh, um, um, look at what they are trying to promote. I remember one study, for example, that talked about cholesterol, that um, those that took this particular cholesterol medication had a 50% better result. Actually, it was a hundred, uh, 150% result uh, over those that placebo. And then when you look very closely, it was uh, two groups divided into a thousand. One group, two people died, which is the, was the drug group. And then the, and the non-drug group, three people died. And so you had to go through 997 people before you found somebody that it worked for. So uh, again, these studies uh, um, uh, are, are, could be very misleading. This next point is really interesting. There are no control studies that show the effectiveness of, of vaccinations, bypass surgery, blood pressure management, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which is kind of interesting. You know, they're doing a lot of studies for vaccinations right now. What you may not be aware of, for example, just take that one, they're not st taking the vaccinations and comparing the new vaccination, comparing it against um, an herb or some other protocol. Most times they are comparing uh, the new vaccination against the old vaccination that was no longer effective. So a lot of people aren't looking at some of these details that are behind uh, some of these uh, studies and, and they can be quite revealing. Of course, it's not so ethical in terms of bypass surgery, et cetera. You don't want to do a whole host of barbarian things to test them. But there are far better procedures for bypass um, uh, in the original medicine approach and for blood pressure management. As a matter of fact, in the original medicine approach, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in my next presentation. Um, and, and the, uh, over 95% of all of the blood pressures can be resolved in seven days. That's how easy it is to fix blood pressure. Yet you see all of these, uh, that is the number one uh, things that people die of. Over 40% of the people that die, die of some kind of cardiovascular event. There are very few incentives for natural health studies. Uh, and so when you come to the conclusion with a lot of these studies, there's more economics and politics involved than science. So let's look at some biblical food for thought in terms of these double blind placebo based studies. And these are two of my favorites. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. So we are focused so much on the germ and these other big things, these other cofactors are being completely ignored. And that's where the real problem is. And this is one of my favorite, favorite ones in Matthew 15, 14, let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. One of my favorite verses also is in Hosea, I believe it's four, six, my people suffer for lack of knowledge. What, by, by not having the knowledge yourself, and we are blessed with this health message, but if we don't, participate, if we don't use it, we are as blind as the blind leaders, and we, uh, we, we may be unwittingly putting ourselves in a position to also fall into that same ditch. You see that with COVID, you're going to continue to see that um, in, 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 when the final plays come, et cetera. So this should be a good reminder, kind of really understand this whole focus on signs and symptoms and this germ theory basis and understand a little bit better this effectiveness of the original medicine perspective. So let's kind of summarize here on the original medicine perspective on germs and disease. And th these are six summary points I'd like to make. First, germs are the lowest form of life, incapable of attacking or killing anything. Second, germs are scavengers 
and decomposes, totally dependent on waste to survive. So you clean up the environment, clean up your internal environment, cleansing, deep breathing, um, contrast showers, baths, um, uh, uh, liver flush, kidney flush, clean out the system. Decomposition of body waste irritate the system and signals the need to eliminate. So that's what the sign is. You need to eliminate those toxins. Disease symptoms are not the disease. Don't cut off the organ. We're not um, suffering from disease because we have too many organs or there's an, a deficiency of drugs available to us. What we need to do is see what those symptoms are telling us and address it by cleansing and rebuilding. So you want to you want to um, um, focus not so much on the disease, but focus on what your capacity, uh, your individual capacity and your requirements are and address it from that standpoint. And the consumption and injection of toxic substances suppress the immune system from doing just that, from enhancing the cleansing, which your body is really trying to do, and, 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 and basically um, compromising the functional integrity of that immune system. And the nourishment and toxic elimination prevents and reverses those symptoms. So, in summary, we really need to put on the full armor of God. And original medicine is that most powerful approach for all diseases. And so in the next presentation, I'm going to cover that in further detail and giving evidence for original medicine's superiority in preventing and reversing all diseases. We're also going to talk about original medicine um, prescription and perspective on the 10 underlying causes of all diseases. So, so we're going to look at those 10 underlying causes and see how the allopathic versus the original medicine, me, original medicine approach fares. And you make the determination. So we'll look at the strength and weaknesses, and then we're going to end up in that second presentation with the two most powerful supplements known to man. So that's in summary what I want to cover for the germ theory. I know that um, this, we're on Zoom. We don't have an opportunity for questions. So what I would say to you is for any of your questions, please make them available to, uh, to, to Mark, Mark Glover. And of course, uh, if you have any questions for me, this is my um, information. The International Institute of Original Medicine is our school where we, are, where we provide both certificate and degree programs all the way from the Certified Nutrition Council to the bachelor's, master's, doctorate, uh, and, and, and just got approval and um, accreditation for our PhD program uh, a few months ago. And so you can contact either myself, the president and CEO of IIOM, uh, my wife, Dr. Lisa Sharps, who is the executive director. And this, this, is, this is our information, www dot iiomonline.com or info at iiomonline.com. So you can contact through any of those and our phone number is 410-884-9319. I want to really thank you for your time and kind attention. I hope this was helpful for you. And I'm looking forward to taking you to part two of this, showing you how the original medicine approach is the most powerful system known to man, the most powerful health system known to man for preventing and reversing all chronic degenerative diseases. We look at allopathy versus naturopathy versus original medicine. Look at the strengths and weaknesses of both. And, we'll, and you'll also see a context for when there is a need for drugs. Don't go to your medicine cabinets and start throwing away your medicines uh, without first looking at some of the very important considerations in the next presentation. And I like to all end all of my presentations by saying, you know, we're in this um, not to be health jargonauts, but to, to basically uh, uh, live according to God's natural health laws and to serve him uh, and to serve him by thanking him for all of his natural blessings and sharing them with others. So I like to end up by saying whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, let's make sure that we're doing all that we do for the glory of God. Again, thank you very much for your time, kind attention. 
Bye for now. And God bless.